Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's get started with our newest webinar edition of Fieldview Focus. Today's session, pre-harvest preparation, is focused on getting ready for harvest. We want to make sure you are ready to collect harvest data with Fieldview. So when your crops are ready, you are too. And let's face it, harvest time will be here before we know it. Let's get right to it and meet our speakers for today. I'm Mindy McDermott, your host, and with me today are two of Fieldview's finest, Tom Burstman and Seth Smoot. Tom and Seth have a wealth of in-field knowledge and lots of experience working with farmers to help them collect data with Fieldview. Tom is going to kick things off for us this morning with some key steps that can be taken prior to harvest to make data collection go smoothly. Seth will focus on equipment setup and some tips on what you can actually do in Fieldview Cab App while you're harvesting. Tom, I'm gonna pass it over to you to get us started. You bet. Thanks, Mindy. Good morning, everybody. So here's a quick agenda for what we'll be running through today. So, uh, we're going to just start with kind of the why, right? The why we're, uh, why we're doing this, why we want to get all the data in, and that's yield analysis. So we're going to do just a quick 30-second uh, overview of what that is, and uh, then we'll jump into some other important things we need to accomplish before we can start collecting that yield data this fall. So after that, we'll go through iOS updates, supported iPads, a few other house cleaning uh uh, pieces with the iPad, and then we'll uh, we'll just confirm some data that we have on the iPad as well that was from planting and making sure our boundaries are good to go. Then Seth is going to uh, take over from there, and he's going to walk you through getting the equipment set up, making sure everything's um, set up correctly in the cab app, and then maybe some post-harvest adjustment as needed, and then things you can do while you're combining. So don't want to steal his thunder too much here, but I think he's got a good... Uh, a good overview for you all here. So again, as Mindy said, if you have questions, be sure to send them in and we'll do our best to get them answered. And if we don't have an answer, we will absolutely get back to you. So with, with that, let's go ahead and jump right in it. So again, kind of, kind of the why, right? We went through planning this spring. We've got the planning data collected. If you didn't have field view this spring and you have your planting data on your monitor, we can work together and get a climate activation specialist partnered with you or our support team to get that planning data uploaded in. And the importance of that is being able to identify which products are in, um, in the CAB app and which products are we looking at for yield data, for example. So that's when we start to look at this hybrid performance port report or the soil type performance report. So again, without those product names from planting, we're really not gonna give you the best data just because we're not gonna know which product was placed where. We can still look at yield analysis, but it will say unknown hybrid um, we could break it down by soil type at that point. But again, getting that planning data in ahead of time is going to give you the best experience. And this is really the why behind getting that yield data in as well, on top of many other things you can do with the FieldView platform. So with that, what are some things to look out for as we approach harvest? So first things first, a big one is just ensuring everything is updated, right? So we always want to make sure we're running the latest version of FieldView Cab and the Climate FieldView uh, app during harvest. Greg Dime, our product manager, has done an excellent job on trying to get any updates out as needed during planting, and he will do the same during harvest. But what we're trying to do is limit those. We want to get a solid foundation out ahead of time, and that's what you want to be on. So the current versions right now for the FieldView app are 6.1.2, so that's the app on the right. And then the FieldView Cab app, which most folks, if you're familiar with, you've run that in the cab of your combine or planner, that's 9.1.2. So be sure to ensure you're running those. You can simply just go to the app store and check to make sure you don't have any updates there. Um, I'll walk you through it live on an iPad here just to make sure we're, we're all on the same page. And then finally, last but not least, iOS 13.6 is the latest version of iOS out to date. We're gonna jump into a little more detail on iOS, and but I, I'd like to make sure anyone that can update the iOS 13.6, go ahead and do so. So that kind of leads to this next slide here. Don't move until it's field view approved. Every fall about this time, Apple is going to release new products and then they do release iOS 14 to come along with it. With about the end of summer or beginning of fall, that's when we'll start to see those updates going out. As our team is uh, beta testing and piloting these versions of iOS and making sure our products do run as best they can on there and fixing what we need to fix ahead of schedule, we do want to ask, if possible, turn off your software updates. Again, I'll walk you through how to do that here on the iPad screen live, but just calling that out with um, 
With iOS 13.6, we know we have a good release. We know our product's working stably on that. So be, be sure to update today because what will happen is if you're on a previous version of iOS 13 and you go to update, it is going to skip that iOS 13.6 and take you right to 14. So it's a good time to update uh, right now and then hold off on 14 if possible. And then you can always update to after harvest as well. So that way everything just we know is working and we can move forward from there. So another big component just to build on that. And I know this sheet might be a little small on some of the screens out there. So this is on our support.climate.com website or knowledge center. Just search your iPad device or just search iPad device and that'll bring up the sheet. But a few things to note here, you know, if, if you're using an iPad, so if iPad uh, Gen 4 looking at the top there that's in the red, that is actually no longer compatible. So you're not actually using the latest version of the cab app. You're going to be a few versions behind. So you may have some challenges with that uh, version of the app with data collection and certain things missing um, that you would have available on a newer iPad. Then we get down to the yellow here, and these are the iPads that are on the way out. And what I mean by that is they are no longer supported for iOS updates. The last version they could run is iOS 12, which for today, that still is gonna work. You're still gonna get data collected. However, long-term planning, you're gonna wanna make sure you update that iPad. So just keep that in mind. As far as iPads following that in the white, iPad Air 2s or newer uh, are still current, right? I would, um, if, you're, if you're looking to buy a new iPad, the Air 2 might be one to stay away from just because it's probably gonna get on that cut list here soon. Uh, I would look at some of the, uh, the green one down there, I believe we have, it, we have it called out, but the iPad Air third generation. So that's a, that's a great one to look for on Apple's website. And typically we can find a sale here, um, especially as we get closer to the, the holiday season. But again, just a few call outs at the top, that red iPad Gen 4 to identify it, um, it's basically got a really thick bezel and the bezel is that black bar that goes around the outside of the screen. And it's the first iPad to have the lightning connector uh, th those are no longer compatible. And then the iPad Air 1s and iPad Mini 3s, those are still working now. But again, just think about future proofing. I I'd be surprised if next year or especially the year after that, if they're still supported. So just something to, uh, something to be aware of. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump over to my iPad. So bear with me for a second. So a few things today in today's agenda and angry angry birds 2 does serve a purpose so i'm not just advertising or throwing it up there today um but uh i do want to come back to that one but a few things to talk about today we're just going to do live on the ipad so first things first again we talked about a handful of things uh there on the slide so if i want to ensure i'm up to date on ios what i need to do is i need to find the settings which it looks like these gears down here so if you can see my let me get my mouse cursor back there we go so I can click my settings and I wanna to go to general. So that's again, the top on my Apple's iPad settings and I wanna click software update. And the reason I'm doing this one is to make sure I'm on the most up-to-date version of iPad OS. So iPad OS is basically iOS for your iPad. So 13.6 is the version I'm on, that's great. If I was on an out-of-dated version, it would say, hey, do you wanna update here? Go ahead and click yes uh, for iPad 13.6. But the next step, if you are up to date, make sure you hit customize updates, kind of like we talked about. And I have mine already shut off, but you wanna make sure you have your download and install iPad OS updates shut off just so we don't get that automatic update uh, during harvest. A lot of times what'll happen, they, they like to be tricky about it. It'll say, do you wanna update your iPad? You say no. Do you want to update your iPad between 2 and 4 a.m.? It says yes or cancel. So it's it seems it's a little misleading there. Uh, cancel means no. So go ahead and hit that if that does happen. But do your best if you can. Just shut that uh, download iPad OS updates off. So let me jump back here. The other piece, too, again, just... Uh, just thinking about it while I'm in here, make sure your Bluetooth is turned on. It's something you can get ahead of here. So I got my Bluetooth device turned on. I'm gonna go ahead and connect my field view drive right now. Let's see if I can't get that going here. And just a quick reminder, you know, you have all that, you have your drives in there. If you need to clean anything out, you certainly can remove them, but there we go. My drive did connect right here. So that's good. 
another just quick opportunity to test and ensure everything is working just because the last time if you did your own drive you used it at planning just make sure everything's going good from there so the next piece that i do want to jump to and i'm just going to close out of my settings here and let's slide back over to uh my field view and field view cab app page and i do have angry birds too there as well so a few things that have happened and i want to walk through is freeing up space on ipads now with newer iPads, generally you have 128 gigs of space, which is great. Um, it's a lot better than that 16 gigs of space that we had on older generation iPads in the past. Uh, not saying they're not usable, but things to watch out for, right? So first off, um, a lot of times I know I have kids, they download apps, they, they put things on your iPad that you don't need, that they're not using. We wanna just delete that. So let's go ahead and tap on Angry Birds there. And let's free up space just with unwanted apps. So if you haven't done it, it is a little different in iOS 13 than it was in previous versions. Just hold your finger on it. You got delete app right there. It's gonna confirm all the apps gonna be deleted. Go ahead and do that. And we freed up a little space there. I will say, um, just be careful doing that with apps because when you do delete it, that data on the iPad is gone. So a perfect example there is the Fieldview Cab app. If you do delete the Cab app off your iPad, and that data is not cloud synced, it is gonna be removed from your iPad. But for unwanted apps, it's a quick and easy way to free up some space. Now, let me jump in my cab app here. And let's say, again, all I'm using this iPad for is in the cab and I'm running a little low on space. So first things first, let's go to the cab app settings. So the gears in the bottom left. And then let me go to data. So if you look at mine, for example, I've got data already from 2020, but I go back pretty far, actually. I go all the way down to 2007, and that's where my data um, stops for me. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you actually see my storage bar. So very simil similar to what you would see in the iPad settings, but I have 102 gigs available of storage space. Um, that's plenty good for me right now. I don't really need to clear anything out, but pretend with me that that bar is full and my iPad's running a little sluggish. I can go through each one of these years. Now, granted, these ones towards the bottom aren't that big, but if we jump up to 2014, 2015, 2016, and 2017, I may not need that data locally on my iPad. The great thing about having both apps is every year is accessible from the cloud in the FieldView app, so I can clear off that local storage on my iPad if I so choose. So what I would do, is I would go to, let's say 2014, 1.7 gigs are taken up by that. And then I would just click clear 2014 data. And that will erase all the data from my iPad locally, but that should be in the cloud. So one way to check before you do this, go to the field view app, drop your fields down, make sure you see some of those 2014 fields and the maps look good. That way everything's cloud synced, you're good to go and just clear off some of that data locally on the iPad. I would hold off on years like 2019, 2018, just in case you have something you wanna look back on, but anything pre 2018, 2017, give or take, I think you're safe to uh, clear off. But a few things just to check again before you do it. First, just in case, make sure your FieldView Plus subscription is active. If something happened and your FieldView Plus subscription did get deactivated for some which reason, you, uh, you may not be fully cloud synced, so make sure that's the case. And second, just ensure uh, that data is on the, on the FieldView app or at climate.com. All right, so the next thing I wanna jump to really quick, and I'm gonna hit my home button here, and let me disconnect my drive again, because I wanna make sure we're, we're doing this like we're sitting on the couch. Um, a good thing to do is just ensure everything is set up from your planting from your planting dates and make sure everything's good to go there. So let me jump to my map here. And let me select a field. Let's scroll down here. So this is a customer I've worked with for, for a long time, and he's uh, allowed me to use some of his fields as examples. And I just want to jump here and show a few things really quick. So there are some opportunities here uh, on this field for improvement. He did a fantastic job planting this field. We're in great shape, everything's looking good for harvest, we're gonna get some good data. But one thing to call out, there is, an, a, there is a feature on climate.com called our fix it tool, and we can dive into a little bit more of that if there's questions, individually one-offs, um, but partner with your local individuals to walk through that tool or go to Knowledge Center where you can find more information.
But with that tool, you can edit crop type and you can edit hybrid info. So for this example, and what I'm getting after is we talked about yield analysis early on. I wanna make sure all my varieties in this field are lined up correctly. So one thing that's gonna throw me off in yield analysis is I do have a lowercase x here. So I wanna make sure that I go into the fix it tool, especially when I have a little downtime before harvest and get that X capitalized. It's not the end of the world if you don't do it, but if I have 40, 91 X's across multiple fields, I'm gonna show in yield analysis 49 or 40, 91 X lowercase. And then if I have it capitalized in other field, it's not gonna be in the same bucket. So I'm not gonna be able to see how that variety performed consistently across my operation. Using the Fix-It tool, I can fix those small edits there, and I'm good to go from there. The other piece that I get a lot of questions on, and I'm sure Seth's in the same boat, and I know Mindy does as well, if I drop down my Variety tab here for this field, I can click this button called Edit Map Options. And I want to talk a little bit about this one too. Uh, it is a really important feature to go through. You can enable different maps as well. Uh, but the one that I, I want to look at here really quick is field boundary detection. So that's right here at the top. I apologize. I'm looking at my screen while I'm circling, not at my iPad. Um, but by default, it's set to prompts. So every time you go into field, it says, hey, you've entered this field. Do you want to make it active? Some folks run into issues with that as you're turning around in fields, right? So if you have two fields butt up next to each other and you turn around in the other field, it's going to prompt you. Hey, do you want to make field A active, even though you're harvesting field B. If you wanna turn it to auto or disabled, you have that option here. Auto, there is a bit of a delay and it's gonna give you this kind of warning here just to be, just to kind of explain the feature. So we'll go ahead and enable that. But auto is gonna have a bit of delay as you change boundaries when you're running your equipment. So if you're trying to harvest multiple fields at once, for example, you would have data slightly in the other fields. So just something to be aware of, something to be uh, cognizant about, but I, the, auto, the auto functionality is great, but I, I do personally prefer the prompt one. And then last but not least, I do, kn I do know some folks don't even wanna deal with it at all, um, but you can totally disable it. The only watch out I would say is when you get to that next field, you do have to change that field to the active field you're in. Otherwise, all the data you run in your combine is gonna end up in the wrong field. So let's say let's say you have five fields, field A is the first field you start in, and you don't change it, all the data for all the data collected for field A, B, C, D, and E will be in field A. So just keep that in mind. Um, again, if you're if you're unsure on what to do, I'd recommend just leaving it as prompt going from there. A few other things just to call out while I'm in here. Some folks have asked before, hey, my field boundaries disappeared. Well, it, what can happen is if you get in here and you toggle that hide button, it will uh, be uh, hidden from you on the map. So let's make sure we show those. And then another one too, if you don't wanna see your field pins, um, you can hide those as well. So again, you're running the combine, you got a lot of field pins from the spring, you can hide those. Um, but for me, I, I do like to be able to see what I did and what I scouted and what I'm looking for specifically, especially if there's something out in the field I'm trying to avoid. So again, this is under map options. If you just drop down where I'm at variety here on the top far right, you can edit that map options bucket. So again, we talked about a handful of things there, the map options piece and the fix it tool. Be sure to check that one out. If you have questions, reach out to uh, your climate activation specialist or work with partner with your local retailer or even the knowledge center is probably one of the best places to start there as well. Again, you can always call us directly and we can we can help you out as best we can too. So just something to think about, but uh, hopefully it helps, uh, helps have a smoother harvest, especially when getting to that yield analysis component. So we've talked about field boundary detection. We've confirmed our planning data. Uh, one last piece I wanna talk about before I transition this over to Seth is drive data offload. So this is something that's kind of, uh, we've started talking more and more about that we haven't really talked about in the past. And it's really important because what can happen is, let's say you're planting a field and all of a sudden you change fields or something comes up and you have to stop immediately. 
there is about 16 gigs of data on that field view drive or a, or a micro SD card in the field view drive. The purpose of that is just to back up data as needed if the equipment were to shut off or if the iPad were to die. So if I go to my settings here, let me connect my drive. I'm gonna click my devices. And there we go, I'm connected to my, my field view drive here. So why drive data offload is important is if you planted a field and 99% of the data was offloaded, you may not see that field in the cloud yet. So what I would do is I would hit edit on the far right. So I'm again in settings, devices, I have my drive connected. That's a key component here. And I'm gonna click edit. And what it's gonna show is your offload status. It should show that first. If it doesn't, it's at the bottom left-hand corner. But what you can do is scroll down and see which fields are 100% offloaded. So I only have a few fields that this drive was used for. They are 100% offloaded. I see my progress right here, 60 out of 60. And my estimated time remaining is zero. If you do see progress, 98, 97%, that means there is some data still on this drive. So let that sync with the iPad and offload to the drive. A lot of times too, if you're connecting a drive and it's been a while, it might pop up and say, hey, is this your field view drive? Hit yes to that if it is, because what that's telling the drive is, hey, it's okay to offload data or no, it's not okay. So be sure to hit yes there. And you may see some time remaining right here so that could take a couple hours or it could take 10 minutes it just depends how much data is on there so do be patient but if you saw some planning maps that didn't look right or looked a little incomplete this is the best spot to start to ensure that data is offloaded so again all you need to do connect your drive to the equipment you don't need to run the equipment just have the ipad in there and you can uh, offload that data if you have an instance where there is a drive that's at 50 percent um uh, and it's going to take like it says it's going to take 24 hours to offload do give our support team a call we can maybe try some other resolutions to get that data off to speed up for you but again most of the time it's around that 99 98 percent of the data has been offloaded and it doesn't take more than a few minutes so something to look for um, i think it's a great it's a great tool that they've added especially giving us the visibility of that so I'll pause there again, Mindy, if anything's come up. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to pass Seth the ball here, and we'll go from there. Thank you. We do not have any questions that have come through. I did uh, send a note in the chat about the Fix-It tool and a resource to help you walk through the Fix-It tool. But Perfect. after we're switching speakers here, um, I will also just give a plug that support.climate.com is a great resource. If you visit that page, you can find just about anything that you need to know um, how to do on FieldView. And again, that is support.climate.com. That is a resource that you can use to look up information, use the search feature at the top to find your information the fastest. And, and you know, if you don't find it there, give us a call. But uh, our support team that is on the phone every day, they use Knowledge Center a lot themselves. But we can see your cab app now, Seth. You are awesome. off and running now. So, again, thanks for your grace, folks. We appreciate it. So well, again, I apologize for that. Uh, typically, it, uh, it goes off without a hitch. Uh, we'll get that fixed for next time. But, uh, yeah, um, Seth Smoot, Climate Activation Manager, uh, covering a Northern Indi Indiana geography. Um, going to walk you through a few things uh, here over the next 15, 20 minutes or so uh, around uh, getting your combine and your header set up, um, you know, what, what some options are for some post harvest yield adjustments. Once we, once we have collected harvest data, uh, and then what are some things you can access or, um, edit while you're harvesting uh, in terms of, uh, the viewpoints, um, that you might have there. So, uh, let's walk through some combine and equipment setup first. Um, so in the field view cab app, uh, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to click on equipment. Um, now you'll see. I've got a pretty extensive list of equipment in my cab app just from random ones I've added over the years. But um, let's imagine that we don't have anything in here or we don't have any combine set up and we need to go down here to add new equipment. Uh, now, once I'm in add new equipment, I want to scroll down uh, and obviously I want to find the combine uh, for this particular scenario. 
And then I'm going to scroll over here and hit next. Uh, then we simply just need to check uh, our, our, you know, select our make or model of, uh, of the combine. So let's go ahead and just select John Deere, hit next, uh, and then the series of combine uh, that you want to, to select. Now, if you do have questions around uh, what our current compatibility is uh, with the field view drive um, and combines, uh, you can always check uh, support.climate.com. Um, and there you'll be able to access our uh, field view drive machine compatibility guide. Um, or as always, you can feel free to reach out to our support number at 888-924-7475. Uh, and we can uh, help you assess what your what your compatibility is. So for this one, let's go ahead and say, hey, you know what? I got a, a 70 series um, and then it's going to ask you to select this specific model. So I'm going to say I got a 9770. And you can name this essentially whatever you want. If you've got multiple combines, you can you can name them that way. Uh, but for this example, I'm just going to say JD um, 9770. Okay, now we're going to hit done. And then the next part. So it's going to say we're almost done. Um, so a few things that we've got to do next. Um, and that's going to be walking through um, some of our some of our measurements. Now, what we've done is um, these should be pretty close. Um, so this is kind of basically just an average of uh, the GPS offsets um, that have been put in for 9770 uh, in the system. Um, but if, if you'd like to be super precise in terms of your combine elevation maps um, and more specifically the front and center um, is, is probably going to be the ones to pay attention to. Um, but um, you know, for this example, we're just going to leave the, the predetermined numbers that are in here. Um, but if you needed to change, hey, my GPS actually isn't in, on the front of my cab. Maybe it sets over my grain bin instead. Uh, then you could change this to offset back. Um, and then you could measure uh, that distance from, from this axle to, uh, to where that globe does set. Or if it is offset to the left or right. Um, then you could come up here and say offset left and then enter uh, the measurement inches in terms of uh, if it is offset from the center of the cab. A um, couple other settings that we're going to go ahead and look at. Um, this flow lag sensor, um, this is going to kind of be a defaulted at 14 seconds. What this uh, right here is, um, and you can adjust this um, as, as you get started harvesting. Um, but if you start to notice, so let's say when you when you come, so you turn on the on the headlands or the end rows, and when you come in to start harvesting, if you notice a really long uh, stretch of red yield data, or um, it, you know more than what you would expect, then you can adjust this flow lag sensor, or maybe um, it starts out you know really really high yield, um, and then it kind of levels out. Typically, that's a scenario where you would want to come in and play around with this number just a little bit um, and, and kind of get a, get a feel for where that is at as well. Um, this automatic swath sensitivity, um, this is going to um, really be determinant of like so when we're harvesting, um, reading your GPS signals and, you know, if we're on these eight rows of, of corn or these 12, um and you know how sensitive we want it to react to um the auto swath control that we'll talk about um now my recommendation would be is that if you have anything other than rtk so if you have was or sf1 or one of the free services leave this on less sensitive um now if you have rtk obviously uh you can you can set it to be a little more sensi sensitive but my recommendation would be to leave it on less sensitive um, and then some other things in here, um, crop settings. Um, this would be where you could come and adjust how you want your data to be calculated. Um, and so we have uh, preset uh, settings in here. So for example, for corn, when we figure yield data, we use a 56 pound test weight, uh, a 15.5 moisture. So when, let's say your corn is, you're harvesting and it's 25%, we will shrink that down to 15.5 uh, for dry bushels. Uh, and then the shrink factor is 1.2. So if you uh, use something different than those numbers, you can come in and adjust those uh, to make the data reflect accordingly. I'd say this is probably one of the, the number one spots where I'll get calls where maybe data in the cab app does not match. 
uh, what your either your OEM monitor says, so your John Deere or your case monitor, or maybe it doesn't match scale tickets. So let's say that your John Deere monitor is set to 15 instead of 15.5, uh, then the numbers will be different, um, and so that could cause a different in, a difference of uh, what those dry bushels show. Um, and so again, if you need to change those, you can simply just tap on here and change that to 15, uh, or you could change your shrink, your shrink factor uh, as well too. Let's bounce up here uh, to heads and have a brief discussion around um, uh, the heads that you will need uh, to set up along with your combine. So uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to hit add new head. And so let's say we're going to go ahead and set up our row crop head uh, or our, our corn head in, in this scenario. And so first thing we got to do is we got to select how many rows um, that we're going to be harvesting with. So right now it defaults to eight. But if I had a 12 row head, I could simply just come over here and, and I could switch this to 12 rows. Um, Again, these measurements are pretty straightforward. Um, only things that I would um, you know, caution around is obviously if you're on something other than a 30 inch row spacing. Uh, so if you were on 20s, you could simply just click on here and you could uh, delete that out and, and then change that to 20 inch row spacing as well too. Um, harvesting height. Um, this is going to be very critical uh, and important uh, when it comes to collecting uh, data um, in the fall. And so what this is, is uh, on most combines uh, utilizing the field view drive, we are going to have to uh, use um, the harvesting height to kind of turn mapping on and turn mapping off. There are some select uh, makes models uh, that use something other than harvesting height. Uh, but in this particular scenario for this John Deere combine, we would need to use uh, the harvesting height. And so basically what the harvesting height is, um is a reading of your feeder house um and so when it's all the way up so you're setting in your combine it would be 100 percent. and when your feeder house is all the way down that would be essentially zero um and so we need to set your harvesting height um so that when you get below a certain threshold it knows that you're going to start harvesting right so for example let's say that in this particular scenario since we're setting up this corn head um when I have my feeder house down in the harvesting position, um, if we were in a combine and we lowered it, this number would change. And so it would, it, as my feeder house went down, this current height number would would reflect that as well. Um, and so right now, all I need to do is where it says disabled, I can click on that and then I can enter uh, a number that I want to set my harvesting height at. Um, but for this example, let's imagine that you you set your corn head down at the height where you're going to be harvesting. And let's say this number says 30. OK, um, that's going to be the number that, you know, typically your head's going to be at about 30 uh, percent of, of height uh, while you're harvesting. Now, we don't want to set max harvesting height right at 30 percent, because as we all know, there's going to be some fluctuation as you go across the field uh, as either there's elevation changes or topography changes. Uh, and your automatic head height um, reacts or if you manually uh, adjust that head height uh, for some of those conditions as well. So my general rule of thumb um, and where I suggest that um, customers typically set this at is, is when you put your head in the harvesting position. And so in this case, let's say that that is 30%. So imagine that it says 30 right here. What I typically instruct people to do is just come over here and add 10% to whatever your uh, current height is. So in this case, I would tell you to set this at 40. Uh, and so that gives you a little bit of that fluctuation uh, as you go across the field so that it doesn't turn mapping off. Because what happens is if we set this number right at 30%, if that head happens to go to 31% or 32% or anything over 30%, it was going to turn mapping off. So we want to make sure that we have a little bit of, uh, of grace in there uh, to where it will continue to record as you go across the field. So that would be uh, suggestions for uh, a corn head. So let's go ahead and hit done. We've got that one set up. Uh, and now let's go ahead and set up our platform. Um, and so instead of row crop, I'm going to simply drop this box down. And I'm going to choose a platform head. Um, and then a couple other first things that we're going to take note of here are swath sections and head width. Uh, now, as you see here, this does default to a 480 inch head width, uh, so a 40 foot in um, this particular case. So if we need to put anything other in there, so let's say we have a 30 foot, um, let's say we've got a, a 30 foot platform. Um, so let's say we need the first thing we need to do is we need to change our head width from 
uh, 480. Uh, we're going to come in here and we're going to put in 360 inches um, for that. And then we can manually adjust this to 30 foot for the name. Okay. Now, when it comes to swath sections, I get a lot of questions around this. This number right here is simply just the number of increments that we that we break your head into. Um, and so in this case, um, you know, the higher the number, the more granular that we're going to break uh, the auto swath down into. And so, for example, um, let's say you're harvesting at an angle or you come to a set of point rows and you're not taking a full 30 foot swath with your bean head. Um, as you start to narrow down how much of the head you're actually harvesting with, we will start to shut sections of that head off um, so that it, we get the acres corrected rec or recorded correctly. Um, and so like in this case, for example, since I have a 30 foot head, if I set this number at 30, I would have this head broke into 31 foot sections. And so if I'm going across the field and I'm leaving a, let's say I'm leaving a foot gap uh, you know, out to the end, um, we will we'll we'll know that you're only harvesting 29 of those 30 feet um, based off your GPS location uh, and how you have the swath section set up. So there's some there's some different ways you can set these swath sections up. Uh, I typically you know encourage you to you know more of them is better. Um, you know sometimes I'll get calls where we've got a 40 foot platform and they only have five sections. Well. You know, that eight, you'd have to be not harvesting eight feet um, of a particular uh, part of that field for us to shut that part of the head off for uh, acre recording. And so uh, the more granular you have this number, the more accurately uh, your acres uh, will be recorded and therefore the more accurate yield data. Um, so kind of a general rule of thumb there. Um, as we go along that way. And then again, uh, on this platform head, still need to set that max harvesting height. Um, and so let's imagine, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting beans in this scenario. We're going to have our head a little lower. So let's say this number is reading 8%. Uh, I'd have you come over here and typically put in 18. Um, again, give us that 10% that threshold um, or adding 10% to that number um, to kind of give us that threshold as we fluctuate going across the field. So there we're going to hit done. Um, so now we have our combine added and we have our two uh, heads added uh, for that particular scenario. So now we are ready to go uh, to the field. So let me go ahead and plug my field view drive in here directly, get it paired up. While I'm doing that, does anybody have any any questions um, at the moment? We do not have any questions that have come in at the moment. I mean, I don't think you can show this, um, though, Seth, um, in your cab app because you won't be connected to an actual combine. But there is also an option to set your head height when you're actually connected um, in the field, right, from cab app to, to the I'm referencing the head height. There is. Yes, that is that is correct. And so I'm going to go ahead and also place the document that references that um, in the chat as well. So you guys can have that in addition to the fix it tool um, document. All right. Yes. All right, so once you have your drive connected, um, first thing we gotta do is before we get ready to harvest is make sure we have that set as the active equipment. Um, so again, I'm gonna come in here and let's scroll down and let's find um, that JD. So here's that JD 9770 combine that we just set. Uh, and we're gonna scroll over here and we're gonna set that as active and we're gonna hit yes. So then we're gonna scroll back up here and now we have that combine set as active. So we're ready to go to the field. So I'm gonna go back up here in the right-hand corner and I'm gonna click on home and then I'm gonna click on map. Uh, and so I'm gonna to attempt to use a drive uh, that does have um, uh, data built into it. Um, so I've got a predetermined field set up here. Um, and so now we're gonna get ready to harvest. And so. Uh, Tom had talked a little bit about field boundary detection, um, and so uh, obviously the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to make our field active, so I had to manually do that in this scenario. 
Uh, and then it's going to confirm uh, which crop we're harvesting. And so in this case, today we're going to be harvesting corn. Um, and so I'm going to confirm that I want to use the nominal moisture uh, weight and shrink factor that you see here. Uh, and now I'm going to hit done. Um, and so I'm going to zoom in on the combine. Um, and so as you can see here, here is what it would appear to look like as you are harvesting uh, going through uh, through the field. And so um, you can see that um, I've got. You know, here, here's my yield data being collected. Uh, I've got my instant yield. I've got my field average uh, that you see over here, my instant moisture um, as I'm going through the field, acres, uh, field pounds, et cetera. Um, and so to reference what Mindy was talking about right here, you can see what my current head height is. So this combine in particular uh, is running at about 40%. If I need to adjust my harvesting height, I can simply click on this box and I can edit it right from this map screen. Okay. Um, and so right now you can see I've got this one set at 50%. Um, and my current height is 40. But what you would see is so let me say I set this at 39. It's going to shut my harvesting off. No mapping is taking place because my head height is currently 40% and my max harvesting height is set at 39. And what you'll notice is, is that my rows down here at the bottom are red. Anytime you make a change or when you start harvesting, there's about a 14 second lag uh, in the time it takes uh, for those changes to make effect. So now you can see it's still harvesting, but there's no data coming in. But I simply come, come back down here. Uh, I'm going to change this to 50. And then once I do that here in about 14 more seconds, it'll start picking that yield data back up. So I did want to I did want to reference that uh, as well, too. Um, so a couple things you can you can you can look at while you're in here. So uh, first thing I want to draw your attention to is this metrics pane over here on the left hand side. Um, you'll notice that there's different um, widgets or boxes um, that you see over here. If you would like to have different ones over there, uh, you can come down here and select this edit button, and then it will give you an option for all of the different um, options that you would be able to, to drag over there to that left hand side um, and, um, and potentially play. So let's say, hey, you know what? Uh, I want, so I've already got yield, I've got moisture. Um, maybe I want to know how many acres are remaining in a field. So if I just simply drag that over there, I can replace one of the ones that's already there. Um, and if in this example, this field was didn't have a boundary, so I don't it doesn't know how many acres it is. But let's say it knew it was an 80 acre field, it would count those acres down uh, for you as well. Another one that I, I think is commonly used, um, and I'm not sure. Uh, let me see here. Um, some of these ones around um, estimated time remaining, estimated bushels remaining. Okay, I'll have a lot of people that will use this estimated bushels remaining one because um, they'll get a lot of questions sometimes around, hey, do I need to bring this truck back to the field? Well, if you have a general idea around um, how many bushels are remaining in the field, it might give you a little better idea uh, around um, around what, uh, you know, how many trucks you're going to need to finish up. And so it uh, looks like my drive uh, just disconnected. Um, but, you know, a couple other things that I'll, that I'll briefly show you. Um, and if you ever want to go in and, and play around with this a little bit uh, and just kind of get a feel for what it looks like or what some of the options might be in the field view cab app under uh, our help um, icon right here, if you click on that, you can come over here to demos. Um, and we've got an extensive list of demos already built, all right? And so one of those is a combine demo. Uh, and so if I wanted to, uh, I can simply just download those and I can come here and I can do these. And it's just a simulated video to show you what I just walked through, right? Um, and this will show you what it looks like to go through the field harvesting, the ability to switch map layers, um, you know, from yield to moisture. Um, we'll walk you through um doing split screen so you'll notice right here that it circles this button right here that looks like an open book uh this will allow you to simply um look at two layers side by side while harvesting um again in this scenario we've got a, a hybrid map over here on the left hand side 
Um, and, it's, and, you know, if we have your planting data in field view, you'll obviously we'll, we'll be able to supply you with um, hybrid variety detection um, and, and some of those things as we go across the field. But um, we'll let this video play and we'll talk through some reports. So here's an example of an uh, on the go field yield report uh, that you can look at yields, um, you know, by hybrid, by variety as you go across the field. Um, and, you know, really some really good options uh, as you're harvesting. Um, but again, you know, here's a load list. Um, so uh, loads can be used for different things. Um, if you're using a precision planning 2020, a lot of times these will correlate with calibrations that you might be doing. Um, if you're using the field view drive, um, a lot of times you could use load lists. Um, you know, if you want to keep track of each load to left from the field. Uh, or if you're you're harvesting a plot and you want to keep track of you know each hybrid or each you know each pass, um, you you got some different uses for the load list there. Uh, but if you are creating new loads, you can simply just tap on that load and it will it will pop that box up and and it'll give you the the data for that load list. Um, you know again, you know we got about six minutes left here. Um, so we talked about uh, the only other thing that I that I would mention. Um, that I think is a very valuable tool uh, during harvest is a feature that we call remote view. Um, and so what remote view uh, is, is the ability for uh, someone other than the combine operator uh, to view what the iPad in the combine sees. OK, um, and so for that to happen, the iPad in the combine has to have a cellular data package or be connected to a hotspot. Uh, in order for a remote view to be able to work. Um, and so um, simply the easiest way to do this is, is that if you're if you're wanting to remote view and you're not in the combine, if you are logged into the same account as the combine operator, okay? And the best way to tell that is, is making sure that whatever it says right here is the same on both iPads. Um, if, if a combine is running in the field or any other piece of equipment for that matter is operating, if I were to come in here to equipment, um, and so let me disconnect my drive real fast. If one of these pieces of equipment was operating in the field, this remote view icon would be lit up like this setup button. So let's say, let's imagine that this, that I'm, you know, I'm wanting to remote view that combine. I would come down here to this JD9770. If it were operating right now, and if, the iPad in the combine had a cellular data package or a hotspot. This re remote view would be lit up. I simply would click on that, uh, and um, then it would take me in to to remotely view what the iPad in the combine is showing. Um, and so, very valuable feature, especially if you're not in the combine and you're wanting to monitor uh, progress, uh, or maybe you're back at the you know at the dryer, um, trying to determine what the moisture is as you're getting the dryer set. Um, lots of different use cases, um, but really, really valuable feature uh, that we get a lot of usage out of uh, in the platform. So uh, with that, I will pause and I will kick it back over to Mindy uh, to wrap us up and, uh, and then we'll be able to answer any questions. And, and just to clarify on that, Seth, that remote view shows up for only folks that are signed into the same field view account. That is correct. Yes, you have to be signed into the same field view account. There, there are ways that if you wanted to remote view someone with a different field view account, or maybe you have a trusted advisor or a dealer that you want to remote view you and what you're doing, it is possible. Um, in that scenario, you would need to come up here to this uh, this icon uh, with the the magnifying glass. You would need to enter whatever their username is and hit search. And if they have an active equipment, it will come up. The, the main difference, and this is very critical and very key, is if you try to remote view someone else's account, it will pop up on their screen and it will tell them, hey, such and such is trying to remote view you. Do you accept or deny? Uh, so they can't just come in and remote view you out of the blue. Um, you know, but if someone from a third party or someone logged into a field view account other than the same one you're logged into tries to remote view you, uh, it is possible, but they would have to go through these steps and you would have to approve their ability to be able to remote view you. Great question. Perfect. Thank you. 
So if you don't see any other questions uh, coming in at this time. Um, folks, if you do have um, questions, uh, now's your uh, last chance to pose those to our experts, Tom and Seth here uh, today. Uh, Tom, I'm going to pass you back the ball so you can bring up our slide deck again, and we will um, wrap this thing up. We do appreciate you all joining us this morning, and um, thank you for doing everything that you can do to get ready for harvest. Um, I'll just do a brief commercial here again for our knowledge center, and that's what you see on the screen. And so some of the best ways to utilize knowledge center is to use that search bar at the top, uh, search for things like head height or um, field boundary detection are some things, or even remote view, uh, things that have co been covered here today on the call that um, you could find documents on, um, on field view. I will give a call out at the bottom of the screen of field view uh, knowledge center and see these suggested articles. And right there in the center is our compatibility guide. Uh, to the left of that is our field view quick start guide. And that thing it is robust, has about 60 to 70 very brief steps on what you need to do for about 60 to 70 things you can do in field view. So that's a great piece uh, to keep handy as well. So we hope that you find Knowledge Center uh, handy. Also on the next slide, um, you can see where we will put this recording once we have it. I mean, you can see that there are five other webinar recordings that we've already loaded this year or this season, uh, starting with spring readiness, and now we're already advanced on to uh, harvest readiness. And so with that, um, I don't see any other questions. Um, any other last points for uh, from Tom or Seth? Um, no, I would just say if you if you need assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to support. Uh, we have a great network of uh, folks that we call climate activation specialists that we'd be happy to get out to the farm to help you make sure that you're set up and ready to go for this fall. Um, so that could be anything from making sure hey, that your drive's connected. We've got your equipment set up in the cab app. Um, maybe you need uh, some sort of an adapter harness to make the field view drive work with your equipment set up or scenario. Um, maybe you're you're planning to use it for this fall and you don't have your planting data and you need help getting your planting data uh, loaded in your field view account. Lots of different scenarios, uh, but we'll be happy to help in any of those. Um, and so we've got a group of folks that we'll, we can send out to the farm uh, at no cost to you um, uh, to help you uh, get ready to go and have success using field view this fall. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and uh you know we can simply reach out by just contacting our support um and they can get you in touch with the right folks um and get someone dispatched out to the farm but uh, i would say that one other thing i wanted to add in there yes yeah. absolutely and don't forget to follow us on our our social media channels on field view um or on twitter at field view as well as field view help and so those are great places to just send in a quick a quick note to support as well and Tom, I see you came off a of mute, so um, give us your last uh, thought this morning. You bet. Yeah, just to echo Seth, uh, great resources out there to take advantage of. The Knowledge Center is one I, I use quite a bit, so do, do take advantage of that. And really the only thing uh, to add on top of that was just have a safe harvest. And uh, hopefully uh, for some of you all enjoying this cool weather that we've had the last couple of days, hopefully that's that's helping everyone out too as, as things start to heat back up. But again, have a safe fall and greatly appreciate uh, everything everyone's doing out there for us. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes, it is certainly feeling a little bit more like the weather that we would have around harvest, at least here in the uh, in the Illinois St. Louis area. So thank you all for joining us. And again, have a safe harvest and we hope to see you again on a future webinar.